Hi everyone, welcome to episode 18. So at the moment with our spawner class, uh, the only thing that we can actually do to define each wave is uh, how many enemies there are and the time between the spawns. So I'd like to add in a few more variables to that little wave class, uh, just so we can sort of play with the difficulty of each wave. So let's for example add in a public float uh, so we can control the move speed of the enemies. Um, perhaps also an integer called hits to kill player, so that will determine their damage. Um, we can have a public float for the enemy's health, and maybe also just a color so we can make the enemies of the different waves be different colors. Uh, just add some variation, just call that variable skin color perhaps. Um, then I'd like the, the final wave of the game to just be a sort of survive as long as you can wave, so just infinite enemies. So I'm going to add a public bool to the top here called infinite. And then uh, in the update method, where we're actually calling the spawn enemy coroutine, we can say that we spawn if the enemy's remaining to spawn is greater than naught, or if, uh, if the current wave is infinite. So we can say or current wave dot infinite, then it doesn't matter how many enemies there are remaining to spawn, because it's infinite. Okay, so now we want to go down to where we're actually instantiating the enemy, and uh, we want to sort of call a method on the enemy and give it all of those characteristics that we define, such as the move speed, health, whatever. Um, so we can say spawned enemy dot, and we'll call a method that we'll create in a moment. Um, just go say set characteristics and we can pass in all of those things so current wave dot move speed current wave dot uh, hits to kill player and likewise for the enemy health and the skin color okay so now we actually want to go onto the enemy and create that set characteristics method so let's do that public void set characteristics takes in a bunch of arguments. First of all, the float move speed, then hits to kill player, enemy health, and lastly, the skin color. Okay, so over here, we're getting our nav mesh agent component, storing it in a variable called pathfinder. So we can just say pathfinder.speed is equal to move speed, and then, um, we want to use the hits to kill player to determine how much damage our enemy deals per hit. So if we want to kill the player in, say, five hits, we'd have to divide the player's health by five to get the damage that we'll inflict. So let's uh, first of all say if we have a target, in other words, we've found the target entity, which is our player, then we can say that our damage variable is equal to target entity dot uh, however much health it starts with divided by the number of hits required to kill the player. Um, and I'm just going to round this up to the closest integer with mathf.seal, like so. Okay, then we can set our starting health variable, our own starting health, to the enemy health. And finally, we want to set the skin color. So let's just cut these two lines uh, out of the start method, paste them down here. So we first get the material from the render component. Then we can set that material. So skin material dot color is equal to the skin color that we defined. All right, now one thing to be aware of is that uh, this set characteristics method is actually going to be called before the start method is called, uh, so in other words, the pathfinder is going to not have been assigned yet. So we actually want to create an awake method. So the awake method will be called as soon as the enemy is instantiated, even before the set characteristics method is called. Uh, so for this reason, it's often good to have things like your get components in the awake method instead of the start method so that you can guarantee that all of those things have been assigned to when you need them. So let's move over some of this stuff into the awake method. Um, so I'm just going to copy all of this and then we'll sort of 
sort out the things we want in the awake method and the things we want in the start method. So in awake, I do definitely want uh, to set the pathfinder and we can search for the player. And when we find the player, we'll set has target equals to true, uh, just to mark that we found it. Um, don't need to set the current state yet. Uh, both of these things we can do in the start method and we won't start this coroutine yet. So let's remove the things that we're already doing in the awake method from the start method. So that's all of this stuff. Um, okay. And instead of searching for the player again, we can just query if it was found in the awake method. Okay, so things are just basically a little bit better organized now. Um, so let's save that and go into Unity and we should see a couple more variables pop up here. Um, so what I want to do now is just to go ahead and create, uh, say, five different maps and then sort of set up the waves for those different maps. So I'm going to go over to the map generator object and uh, before I begin setting up these different maps, uh, I'd like to, like to just add in a sort of backing tile to the, to the floor um, so that we're not just seeing this sort of skybox behind it. Um, so I'm going to duplicate the nav mesh floor, just call that map floor perhaps, and change the cast shadows from shadows only to off so we can actually see that being rendered. And let's make a new material for it. I'll call it something like um, ground backing. Make that a solid black, right? And don't want it interfering with our tiles, of course. So we can just move it down a tiny bit on the y-axis. Uh, since it's rotated 90 degrees, it's the y-axis, not the z-axis. So say negative 0.1 maybe. And uh, I guess this can sort of act as our floor now, so we no longer need to have the floor box collider on the map object. So I'll just copy that and then remove it. And we can also remove the floor layer from the map object and add it instead to the map floor. All right, added, and I will paste in that box collider component and just reset it, okay. So uh, we, of course, want this sort of automatically resizing to fit the map. Um, for now, I'm just going to set it to 1, 1, 1. And for this box collider, we want it to have a tiny bit of height. Um, so say 0.1 on the z-axis. All right. So let's go into the map generator script. And over here, like we have a transform variable for the nav mesh floor, Let's also create a transform variable for the map floor. All right. And we'll no longer have this line where we're setting the box collider for the floor. Um, we'll just go down to the bottom instead. And here we're setting the nav mesh floor scale. We'll also set the map floor scale. So map floor dot local scale is equal to and uh, that'll be a, what will that be? Um, in fact, let me just go back quickly. I shouldn't have been so quick to delete this because that is the exact factor three that I want. All right, go down now. Map floor dot local scale is equal to that, um, except we need to change the Z axis to the Y axis since it's rotated 90 degrees. So just like that will be good. Um, so if we just let that regenerate, ah, I need to assign the map floor first, of course, just over there, generate map. And we've now got this sort of black backing, which just looks uh, slightly more stylish. All right. So let's, let's get to creating these different maps. So I want five different maps. So I'll set the maps array size to five and I'm going to just work backwards through all of these. So starting with a map index of four, let's uh, let's make this map say a sort of because this is going to be the infinite round. So maybe it can just be really big and sort of quite sparsely populated with obstacles. Um, so 
I'll make that a really low obstacle percent. And for the map size, just as big as can fit on the screen, so say 22 by 12, maybe 21 by 12. Um, okay, it's still too many obstacles, I think. I can maybe just play with the seed a bit, get a configuration I like. Yeah, that's quite nice. Um, I think I maybe want to increase the tile outline percent a tiny bit. I'm not sure. Something like that, maybe. Okay. Um, so that one is set up. Let's go to map index three. And I'm just going to let the rest of this run in fast forward mode. Don't have anything particularly interesting to say at this juncture. Just messing around with different colors, different map sizes, and yeah, just getting some interesting variation to the levels. Okay, so I've got my five maps set up. Here's map one, map two, map three, map four, and map five. Uh, so the next thing I'd like to do is set up the corresponding waves. Let's go into the spawn object and create five different waves. And uh, obviously most of these values we're going to have to change through playtesting um, to get sort of good difficulty curve. But let's guess some values for now. Say we start off with 40 enemies and time between spawns can be, uh, I don't know, 0.7. They can move at a speed of 2.2, take five hits to kill the player and have a health of one. Maybe make them a greenish color, then next wave, ramp the enemy count up to 60. Okay, say something like that. And then the last one is of course uh, infinite. Just so this doesn't get confusing, I'll set the enemy count to negative one. So that's obviously not a valid uh, entry. So then we know that it's infinite. Uh, time between spawns, want them to spawn pretty fast, maybe 0.4. Uh, for the move speed, maybe make that mm, 4. Takes one hit to kill the player, and also one hit to kill. Okay, and I'll leave them at the sort of dark color. All right, so let's save that. And uh, I'd like to add in a way so that we can sort of, um, while we're playing, just quickly skip through levels. Uh, just for playtesting purposes. So let's go into the spawner class and in the update method, um, let, let's actually add a bool here, public bool at the top. We can call this developer mode. So if we are in developer mode, then if we press, say, the... Um, maybe the return key, then we want to skip ahead to the next wave so we can call next wave. Um, but before we call it, we're going to have to destroy all of the enemies that are in the current wave. And we're also going to want to stop the spawn enemy coroutine. So it, any, enemy, any enemies that are currently being spawned sort of cancel. So we can say stop coroutine and we can give it the name spawn enemy. Um, so here where we're starting the coroutine, we should actually be calling this with the name as a string like so, uh, because for some reason you can only stop coroutines that have been called in this manner. Um, okay, so having stopped that, we want to destroy all of the enemies currently alive. So let's say for each enemy, um, just call it enemy in, find all the objects of type enemy in the scene. Um, we can say game object dot destroy enemy dot game object. All right, let's try that out. So we hop into Unity, press play. We've got all these green enemies spawning in and they're nice and slow. And then let's press return. And oh, I'm not in dev mode. Oops, let's go spawner, turn on developer mode, and now that should work. So press return, and we hop into the next level. 
Hit it again, and again, and again. Let's let's just try out this last level. Um, yeah, so I think maybe I'd like to turn up their acceleration a bit so that they don't start off so slowly, and maybe also increase their turn speed so that uh, they can navigate around obstacles more quickly. So I'm just going to go onto the enemy prefab, and here for the um, for the angular speed, which is their turning speed, I'll set that up to 720, and for the acceleration, maybe set that to 20. Okay, so save, and let's uh, just fast forward to that last round again. Yeah, this looks nice and intense. Um, it's maybe still a bit too easy for the last round, um, but yeah, we'll do some some play testing and balancing at some later point and uh, get that all sorted out. But for now, uh, that's enough for this episode. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.